Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take two data points. We use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor, with you from Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. And uh, hi to anyone who is with us for the first time. Maybe you came to us through the big profile of Adam that just appeared in New York Magazine. It was all very flattering uh, about Adam, but we're happy to play our part in uh, the general phenomenon. Uh, Been happy with the reception, Adam? Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm a little embarrassed, obviously. uh, (laughs) Yes, it was very nice and a lot of lot of people I, <laughs> said very nice things about me. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, deservedly so, I feel comfortable saying. Um, but we will move on to the normal agenda here. Uh, the second data point today will be tied to April Fool's Day, which is the day that this podcast is appearing, dropping, whichever of those words is the appropriate verb. And we'll be talking about the economics of humor. But first, a data point from the news. That number is five, as in five years. That's the number of years that French President Emmanuel Macron has already been in office. It's also the number of years he's hoping to win in the coming presidential election on April 10th. The presidential election battle in France is heating up already. The war in Ukraine gave Macron a strong edge earlier on. But his credentials as a leader in a time of crisis are being overshadowed by people's main concern today, the cost of living. Several crises have marked his term, from the Yellow Vest movement to the Benalla affair to pension reform protests to the coronavirus pandemic. Right now the campaign's in full swing. The polls seem promising, but it's probably still too early to celebrate. Doesn't seem too early, though, to reflect on what Macron has meant for France. He's uh, never really shied away from claiming that he's on a kind of mission uh, to change France in some way. And especially in that first campaign, he he liked to emphasize that he wanted to change France's economy, to make it more dynamic, more entrepreneurial. It was all in line with his background as a, a former investment banker as well as a former economics minister. So... I figured we could assess how Macron has done, but I wanted to start with a bit more background on him. I mean, Adam, what exactly is Macron's ideology? I mean, when I've tried to make sense of it, I've had trouble. I mean, he's not a social democrat. He's not a sort of traditional European conservative Christian democrat. So what's left? What is he? I mean, any precedents from European history that come to mind? So, yeah, I mean, Macron's hard to place. He he doesn't he doesn't easily fit within classic models of European social democracy, for sure. But he does come from the progressive side, right? He comes out of the disintegration of the French Socialist Party, which was the left party alternative to the communists who were very powerful in French politics through the 1980s. And he was a minister in the last socialist government headed by François Hollande. I mean, if you want to really get into, I think, Macron's mind, there's there's a great article in Foreign Policy by Blake Smith appeared earlier this year, which tries to locate him against the thinking of the philosopher Paul Ricoeur and the political precedent of Michel Rocard, who was one of the people who shepherded neoliberal policies into government in France under the previous uh, but one socialist president, so the legendary François Mitterrand in the 1980s. And I mean, they have in common that they're basically on a migratory path from a kind of nonconformist leftism in the 1960s to a kind of reconciled acceptance of the inevitability of global markets and global market pressures in the 80s and 90s. And the interesting thing about Ricoeur and Ocar is that they then redefine the role of politics as essentially the creation of meaning, the creation of, of, of substantive ideas to which people can attach themselves in the modern political system. Their problem, in a sense, is alienation that they want to overcome. Macron, after all, given his profile, could have been a a rather bloodless technocrat. And instead, as we know, he he positively affirms the role of ideology and that he sees the role of politics in giving meaning to the entire business of modern governance and the carrying on of economic activity. I mean, what exactly the the positive intention here is, is a little bit harder to define. Um, You know, he knows what he's against. He's against civil war. He's against, you know, um, the alienation of the famous banlieue of, of France, the suburban housing developments. He wants um, France to own its own history and to come to terms with it. 
Um, those are all very vague things, though. And in practice, so much of Macron's governance has amounted to a rather aggressive, authoritarian, almost assertion of the power of the state, be it against the Gilets Jaunes protesters in 2018 or over COVID. I mean, one can't really detach this, I think, from the social base which he serves. And given the way in which the French electoral system works, he only needs, after all, to come first or second in the first round of the election. And then after that, since he's almost certain to face an obnoxious far right politician, he carries the day with left votes. And so his core constituency is a kind of impatient, upper middle class, educated, uh, technocratic group, really, um, for whom he represents a vision of a a modern France. It has a touch of leftism about it, I think, in that residual sense that it's about reform, it's about modernity, it's also Atlanticist in its in its emphasis. Okay, so as I mentioned, he did come into office promising big change, even a revolution, if you go back to his sort of first campaign book from five years ago, and specifically a revolution in economics. So has he fulfilled that promise? Has he changed France's relationship to its own economy? And if so, how? And I guess if not, why not? Yeah, I mean, the French are as addicted to this talk about revolution as the Americans are, I mean, perhaps even more so, especially if you come from the Republican side of politics like Macron. I mean, in practice, though, French political economy is very tough to shift. There have been some changes that, broadly speaking, as it were, point in Macron's direction. But then the other thing to reckon with, of course, is that he was elected in 2017 and then from 2020 onwards has been dealing with COVID. So if you if you ask the question, like, has he reduced the share of the state in the French economy? You can use the metric of state spending as a share of GDP. And that popped in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008-9 from 53 to 57%. And then over the course of the following years, and quite rapidly in the first years of Macron's presidency, it fell back to 55%. So hardly a revolution, but certainly a shift in the sort of direction that he's thinking of. But then COVID strikes and with really an embrace of large deficits and heavy government spending, the state share in French GDP rose to 62%, which is really a staggeringly large number by American standards. And the only promise they've made so far is that they will reduce the deficit of the French government to the European norm of 3% by 2027. So that'll be most of his second term as president. Um the labour market, however, I think is really the core of the Macronite vision, right? He has this vision, I think, of France needing to work more, uh, people to get off, you know, uh, their sofas and be- get into the labour market. There's this sort of energetic, uh, impulsive drive to drive people into the labour market. And there has been some numbers that point in that direction, right? So the share of prime age French workers in employment has risen from 64 to 67.5%. Again, not a revolution, but a move in Macron's direction, a surge in self-employment. So folks not registering entire complex businesses, but simply registering themselves as self-employed from a regular number of about 20,000 such registrations per month before he came into office to more like 60,000 today. So that's some sort of trace of this entrepreneurial ideology. And in, in the election, he's doubled down. I mean, he's used his commanding lead in the polls um, to to radicalise his message in a sense. He's now threatening or promising, depending on your point of view, to raise the retirement age from 62 to 65 to further slash taxes, to unify the welfare benefit system so as to incentivise, quote unquote, people going back to work. The whole thing reminds me a little bit, I have to say, of the kind of reform agenda that we saw in Germany in the late 90s and early 2000s. And again, one must put reform in inverted commas in scare quotes, because it's one of the most controversial phases of German social policy in recent decades. It did, however, have the effect of pushing people back into the labour market, even if sometimes at low wages. And I think that's probably the model that Macron ultimately has in mind. Yeah, I mean, just also for my own macroeconomic understanding here, I mean, he could sort of achieve the same effect by like sort of increasing immigration, I mean, increasing economic activity in this way. But but this is a sort of the ideology here is that work is sort of a social good for its own sake, in a way. I mean, we want to sort of increase the share of people working. It's not just about overall growth in that way. Or is there a kind of ideology of pro-work as such? <laughs> There is, yeah. I mean, he's literally made this rather odd combination, a connection in the current um, you know, election between France's fiscal situation, um, so its government deficit, and the need for French people to work. <laughs> so it's, uh, it is. I mean, and this is 
this actually is really a kind of core conservative idea, um, which has come more and more to the fore in in the current campaign. And it's one that I, yeah, I just don't, I don't naturally associate with France. And that maybe is the change exactly that he's referring to when he sees himself as this revolutionary. But um, well, the the thing to know about France is that you're right that as it were, France doesn't necessarily have the the reputation as the most laborious society in Europe. Hmm. Um, you know, famously, they have rules about whether you're allowed to answer emails at the weekend. But the standout thing about the French is the productivity per hour worked, which is up there with the very best in the world. Hmm. So it's a society with a with a serious ethic of efficiency and productivity. Hmm. Um, but what I mean, Macron wants to add to it, I think, is just sheer volume of effort in some sense, like, you know, really to get everyone. And I think that's where his social vision kicks in. This is the idea that that folks that are detached from the labor market drift into they become exiled, if you like, from this national narrative, from this meaning of common purpose that he intends to convey as president. So it seems to me that Macron has also had this sort of other branch of his ambition, specifically focused on the European Union and making that into a more effective economic, but also geopolitical entity. I mean, has he had success there? Yeah, this was initially a story of disappointment because he came in as the great hope for Europe, right? He was, as it were, the answer to the populist spook of 15, 16, 17. And here he was, and he, he gave this famous speech at the Sorbonne in September 2017. And his buzzwords were things like, you know, l'Europe qui protège, the Europe that will protect. And then he waited, and he waited, and he waited for an answer from Berlin, from Angela Merkel's last government, and it never came. And so there was this sense that, as it were, the Macronite promise of a new Europe was a busted flush. Um, but then... COVID hit. And in the first couple of months of the COVID crisis in March and April 2020, there was this sense that Europe was circling the drain again. But then there was this breakthrough brokered between Paris and um, Berlin uh, with key members of the Macron team at the very forefront of it that opened the door then to the agreement on next gen EU, the common borrowing, the program of investment. And I think to that extent, you have to say that he has proven a dynamic and quite effective force in changing the balance of European politics and exploiting the crisis that, that COVID presented to drive Europe in a new direction. Again, also his language on sovereignty and strategic autonomy, which once upon a time seemed rather outré, when Europe did finally move against China, along with the Biden administration in 2021, we all ended up, all of Europe ended up speaking a kind of Macronite uh, vocabulary. So I think over the long haul, he's he's has proven certainly the most influential French politician in Europe for a long time. I'd like to, to take a, a slightly broader look at the campaign. I mean, specifically, what's interested me is the way it seems to have offered a portrait of varieties of economic populism on offer right now. I mean, if I understand correctly, the top among the top four candidates, and that means the other three candidates aside from Macron, it seems fair to describe them as basically anti-establishment populist figures, but they're quite different from one another. I mean, on one hand, you have Eric Zemmour, who seems to be combining kind of high culture appeals to French history and elevated language about the integrity of French culture, together with kind of xenophobic policies against immigrants. And then alongside that, you have Marine Le Pen on the right and Jean Mélenchon on the left, both of whom are kind of placing an emphasis on identifying with the left behind economically. And I don't know, it got me, got me wondering whether you think there's a kind of, yeah, again, like I said, a portrait of the spectrum of populism. I mean, a, a kind of down market style of populism that is focusing on the economic kind of left behind and then a kind of more up market version that's focused on bourgeois, uh, maybe voters who are interested in this and more candidacy. But what does this say about populism these days, Adam? I think that's Broadly speaking, correct. I mean, but the crucial word you haven't uttered in that description is race. And and what Zamour really does is to split the racist vote between the more lowbrow and the more highbrow versions. And that's profoundly damaging to Le Pen. Mm -hmm. Because previously she was able, as it were, to rally a broad social spectrum around an anti-immigrant, anti-Islamic position. And now that camp is split. Meanwhile, Zamour and Pécresse um, the more centrist conservatives split the bourgeois conservative vote amongst themselves. And so 
it's really a well-nigh ideal setting for Macron um, because really there's no single coherent challenger on the right. And from Mélenchon and Jadot, the Green on the left, he has nothing to fear anyway. And though a vote of large proportion of the Manry way will end up switching to Macron in the runoff when he most likely faces Le Pen. Mm. I guess then this just leads to a final question, which is, is France just a more conservative country than people? And I guess I'm talking about myself would have been inclined to think. Again, we look at the main candidates. We have Macron, who's basically a kind of center-right, maybe a centrist, you know, has some conservative policies. And aside from him, there's uh, three of the other four main candidates are, are, are types of conservatives. I mean, France generally has kind of a strong nationalist, patriotic strain in its politics. There's, I don't know, sentimentalization of rural life. Is France just a right-wing outlier among Western European countries? Is this a conservative country? Should we feel comfortable saying? I mean, the French themselves have coined this phrase droitisation, which is the rightification of French politics. Um, and, the, and that, I think, indexes the fact that for French intellectuals, at least, this is a dismaying and, and surprising development. And the, and the position of the left is you know, historically weak at this moment. But I think it's also worth saying that all things are relative. And when you say Macron is a centre-right politician, you're applying, you're not applying hmm. the standards of United States politics today. I mean, this is somebody who's tough on COVID, who favours nationalising the electricity company, all the better to drive the energy transition. Um, so we're not talking about the GOP here. And furthermore, France is no outlier. I mean, in fact, in a recent comparative poll, both the UK and most of all Italy come out far ahead of France in terms of the right-wing shift in public opinion. Uh, according to polls in Italy right now, the three right-wing parties would get over 46% of the vote. And of those, one of them, the Fratelli d'Italia, is a, you know, it's a lineal descendant of fascism. Yeah, so maybe there's, maybe there's a broader point here that Europe as a whole is more conservative than Americans are inclined to think. I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, no, no, there really is a broad and solid group of conservative parties, some of which are really very right wing, that um, are very important, notably in, in Italy and the UK. Well, that's a subject for another podcast. But for now, we will leave it there and be back in a second to talk about the economics of uh, humor. OK. Welcome back. Our next data point is zero. That is actually the punchline to a joke that is uh, about economists uh, that I'll tell in just a second. But as I said at the top of the show, this segment will be about the economics of humor. It's April Fool's Day, at least the day that we're releasing this podcast. And uh, so the joke it goes, uh, how many Chicago school economists does it take to change a light bulb? And yeah, again, the answer is zero. That's because if it really needed changing, it would have changed itself. That's a little obscure, I guess. But I guess the point is the free market would have taken care of the light bulb already. Or am I, is that basically right, Adam, as far as you can tell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. Got to laugh. All right. So since we're doing this on the occasion of April Fool's Day, I figured we could start by discussing practical jokes. I was wondering, Adam, if there are any examples of practical jokes from history, I don't know, that have had any major economic consequences as a result. I mean, anything come to mind there, Adam? I was a bit stumped by this, to be honest. I mean, the, the only the sort of macroscopic practical joke that immediately comes to mind as a historian is the famous Orson Welles broadcast mm. of War of the Worlds in 1938, you know, the H.G. Wells novel, which caused a genuine bona fide panic for at least an hour or so across large parts of the United States where people were convinced that, that there was going to be a Martian invasion. And what really struck me about this is the way that he started, which was in fact with business news. So it was, it was near the end of October. Business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. And on this particular evening, you know, then they discover these Martian, these flares on, on Mars. Hmm. And that was how he chose to set it up. So against the backdrop of regular economic news flow. But I mean, if I was going to be a bit provocative, and you know, it is after all the 1st of April. I mean, I, I'd really say, I mean, I can't help wondering whether 
you know, Boris Johnson isn't a practical <laughs> joke. Um, or, or Brexit, mm. frankly, or even Trump's bid for the presidency. I mean, they all have something of a prank-like quality to them. It's like, you know, can we pull this off? I mean, you certainly get the impression that Boris Johnson thinks of Brexit as jolly good fun, basically. Yeah, and that actually is clarifying in a way as well, because it's as if they didn't want it to become reality. It was just meant to be a joke, and now it's actually real, uh, and they're having to deal with the consequences. But to think about humor more generally here, are there, as far as you can tell, uh, any sort of economic preconditions for making jokes in the first place? Or are there economic kind of conditions necessary for finding something funny? Any literature out there on that question? Well, I mean, you and I both dug in on this, and credit where credit's due, you came up with this amazing, <laughs> this amazing article, which I will, with a straight face, attempt to read the abstract of, because, um, you know, the humour is infectious here. Anyway, this is a paper by three authors, perhaps non-coincidentally from Greek universities in 2016, with the title, The Role of Economic Conditions on Humour Generation and Attitude Towards Humorous TV Commercials. And the abstract reads as follows. A two-phase experimental study investigates the role of economic conditions on humor generation and on the relationship between perceived, perceived humor and attitudes towards the advertisement. It designates that the economic context affects the generation of humor and the relationship between perceived humor and the advertisement. TV commercials can more effectively create humor as well as positive advertising effects in an expansion rather than in a recession. The generation of humor during a recession requires a combination of high levels of perceived surprise and low levels of perceived irritation. In the same vein, attitude towards a humorous ad in a recession increases significantly only when there is a high perceived humor and low perceived irritation factor. And then they go on, I mean, to spell out, this is, I mean, the tragic side of this is that their two samples were taken from 2006 and 2013. In 2006, the Greek economy was growing at 4% per annum. And in 2013, the Greek economy was contracting by 4% per annum. So they literally conducted this study <laughs> of the humorous impact of more or less irritating TV advertisements across one of the great economic disasters of the modern period. I mean, truly a cat catastrophe on the scale of the Great Depression. Well, I think you should also sort of briefly translate the results they found. So I mean, basically, how did the, how did the recession affect the, the, the humor generation, to put it in their terms? I think broadly speaking, it means you have to be a bit tactful and genuinely funny in a recession, because you're otherwise going to upset people. <laughs> And that in a economic boom, frankly, you can get away with trashier advertising. Okay, there you go. Okay, there you go. The bar is higher in a recession. So I guess another more general question here is whether humor, I can, in some economic sense, should be considered conservative. And just to clarify what my thinking here, it seems to me when you're making jokes, it might seem subversive, but you're kind of offering a release and precisely not trying to change the situation you're addressing. You're kind of accommodating your audience to the status quo. Um, and that's, you know, opposed to trying to organize action or start a revolution or something. So, I mean, have economic thinkers or you know, folks who've thought about revolution on the left, et cetera, have they ever analyzed the value of humor along these lines, as far as you know? I think that's an acute observation. Clearly, black humor can be a way of accommodating oneself to a really bad situation. It's it's not for nothing that it's a common feature of military culture. Um, and people have said in the context of the Ukraine crisis that to understand the way in which the Ukraine's, Ukrainians have been able to react and cope with the terrible shock of the war is that they draw on deep reservoirs of black humor, essentially, that have seen them through decades of hard times. On the other hand, I think, you know, it's tempting to push back a little bit about on this and to say that there are a few things, after all, more con corrosive of legitimacy than mockery. Hmm. Um, how destabilizing it is, I think, depends critically on whether it's a kind of resigned shrug of the shoulders or a kind of uproarious, massive declaration that the emperor has no clothes. And Oh, isn't it funny? Like, you know, how ridiculous they are. This is one of the reasons why people make jokes about economists, is that they, after all, pretend to power and influence to an extraordinary extent. It's not as though people make jokes about art historians or anthropologists or, or you know, literary critics to quite the same extent, because they're not 
they're not in those kind of positions of power. Um, and it's striking that the new social movements of the last 10 years or so, starting with, say, the Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street or the big up, uh, upheavals in Turkey and Brazil in 2013, all of them were to a considerable extent humor driven. Um, and so, in fact, are some of the new populist movements in, in Europe. You know, Beppe Grillo, after all, was the driving force of the five star movement in Italy, which broke through. Now, that's not a revolutionary force by any means. But it suggests the way in which humor can genuinely help to break the status quo in political systems. And perhaps it isn't, after all, entirely coincidental that that, the President Zelensky of of Ukraine is, after all, an accomplished, humorous actor. You know, he knows how to carry a line and to deliver a punchline and he can pivot from exact, you know, from a satirical political drama to to deadly seriousness. I mean, I guess I would offer a counterexample in Donald Trump. I mean, you mentioned Boris Johnson, Donald Trump at the top. And and yeah, these are people who are humorous themselves in their own way. It was always obvious to me that Donald Trump was also a talented comedic figure and not just a sort of an object of comedy, but a kind of creator of, of comedy in some sense as well. But examples on both sides, point taken. But yeah, I guess this also leads to kind of an opportunity for some self-reflection here because... Yeah, it seems to me part of what we're doing and have been doing now for a while on this podcast is, you know, trying to make an economic minded worldview accessible to people who may not have an immediate affinity for it. You know, we're trying to make economics interesting, you know, and fun and and yes, even, you know, occasionally funny. And I don't know, I think that's a useful corrective because a lot of people might think of economics as dry and, and technical but I don't know, that got me wondering, did economics always have that reputation, that kind of dry technical reputation? Or was there a time when economics was more widely identified as freewheeling, as humanistic and even fun? I'm not sure whether it, economics ever had a phase in which it was overwhelmingly seen as fun. It was certainly more freewheeling and humanistic in the 18th century and the theorists of commercial society. I mean, they almost made freewheeling, humanistic approaches to life and their access by way of commerce into part of their mantra, that this is the promise of the Scottish Enlightenment, for instance. It's really in the 19th century, in the first half of the 19th century, that economics acquires its reputation as being grim, as being dry, as being dismal. Um, And it's a sort of combination of gloomy predictions, uh, formal presentations, and a lot of statistics, um, which all come together as constitutive of the economics, emerging economics discipline, or well, discipline is quite strong, but the emerging econo- idea of what economics is in the 1820s and 1830s. And so a lot of people take as the, the pivotal moment, the pronouncements by Carlyle, the great conservative reactionary in some ways, British thinker of the 1840s and 1850s, who coined the phrase, the dismal science. And it's often taken that Carlyle was referring to uh, the thinking of Robert Malthus, who famously predicted, you know, that that population would run ahead of food supply. And so the balance would be achieved, the equilibrium would be achieved through famine um, and and disaster. In fact, it's even a grimmer story than that, because Carlyle was an apologist for slavery. And he, in fact, coined the phrase in protest against economists arguing that corporal punishment, the whipping of slaves, didn't make economic sense. And Carlyle, you know, waves away um, this dismal science of economics, which doesn't understand the natural relationship between master and slave, and insists that hierarchy should predominate. So hidden in this denunciation of economics is, in fact, a, you might take it almost as a celebration of um of uh, economics is liberal predisposition. This is an, uh, a, a novel, as I found this online. I was very surprised by it. It's a, due to the economist Robert Dixon, who teaches at the economics department in Melbourne. And it's a, because I'd always assumed, and I think most people are raised on the idea that the dismal science is because of Malthus. And it may in fact simply be that it wasn't reactionary enough for Carlyle's taste. Oh, wow. Okay. So that was the cheerful rejoinder to the dismal science was to be more cruel to one's human prop. Well, yes, to be authentically cruel, right, rather than to engage in this stupid calculus of utility that would suggest that probably beating your slaves is is not best practice and probably not good for for, for productivity. And yeah. I, and I mean, I, I there is indeed an entire genre of 
um, you know, very, re- I mean, work in the last couple of decades. I mean, the free economics people who are the authors of this kind of vision of economics as a sort of almost entertaining, counterintuitive kind of logic. I mean, personally, I don't find that the very convincing paradigm. It's not the one that we pursue because t- to a large extent, it just boils down to finding fancy new ways of applying rational choice theory to situations where you wouldn't expect it to apply. You know, the rational, rational drug dealer and and all of these kind of uh, cutesy examples, really, of the application of what is in itself, I think, really rather a simplistic view of human interaction. So, I, you know, I think our agenda is more along the lines of taking economic life in its richness and its variety seriously and, and trying to explain. So I, rather than, I mean, it's not as though it's not fun. But I think the interest surely is fundamentally is 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 the, the aim fundamentally is one of, of of interest and explanation rather than of amusement in any simple sense. Yeah, I was thinking it would you know personally I would I guess I would rather have a beer with you know sort of earlier humanistic economists of the kind <laughs> that, that could sort of shift from you know discussions of philosophy to literature to to uh, you know I guess uh, grain harvests all in one page of Adam Smith or Karl Marx or whoever uh, those thinkers were at the time rather than I guess the presentations one might come across in academic conference today but I guess you know just to end on the question of whether you know from history any particularly funny economists that come to mind I mean any any sort of Maybe you have personal anecdotes to share here. If you don't, I would accept an economics-related joke, Adam, if you have one. I oh, know. Actually, I have, a, I, have a, I have a hero of, of witty economic writings. Alan Blinder, the, the Princeton economist hmm. who was vice chair of the Fed under Alan Greenspan when Janet Yellen was also cutting her teeth. And he is, uh, he's really a notably um, witty writer. Um, hmm. And he did this classic paper from 1974 on the economics of teeth brushing which is an extended parody on the human capital theory and it includes you know references to i believe fake papers on you know that compare the the habits of longshoremen in dental hygiene with those of matched twins and uh, attempts to rationalize the dental hygiene of restaurant workers um, of different grades, you know, insisting that the French nationality of the chefs cannot explain the fact that cooks brush their teeth rather less often than the wait staff and <laughs> produces this model yielding the insight that junior faculty would be far more likely to brush their teeth than tenured colleagues for whom bad breath was a badge of honour. And then <laughs> the killer of it all is the, the prediction, the, the confident and precisely quantified prediction that news anchors are likely to spend approximately half their lives brushing their teeth to achieve the requisite level of whiteness, um, which is a vastly more precise prediction, obviously, than, than, than anything that sociological theory could hope to yield. So it's really a, it's really a very, funny, uh, very funny paper. Well, I'm glad to know that there was someone, you know, with that degree of wit on the Federal Reserve uh, Board, maybe sort of cracking some some jokes while uh, trying to determine interest rates that, that wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a bad thing but we'll leave it there for now and you know be careful out there on April Fool's Day and uh, yeah we'll be back next week okay that's it for another episode of ones and twos thanks as always to my co-host Adam twos Listeners, as always, we like hearing your feedback. Please email us at podcasts at foreignpolicy.com or tweet us at ones and twos pod. Remember, that's twos as in Adam's name, T O O Z E. And of course, uh, remember to follow and review us uh, on your favorite podcast app. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It's produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tatey. The executive editor of FP Podcast is Dan Efron. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. Mm-hmm.